I'm talking with one hand because I've got a cat napping on the other one. I mean, who doesn't need a cloak? Whether you're serious about your magical wardrobe, a cosplay enthusiast, or simply in need of a Halloween costume, you're likely looking for a way to get exactly the look you want without paying for an overpriced, underwhelming bit of poor quality fabric designed to hold up for only one or two wears. Fortunately, making a cloak is an easy project, even if it's your first time using a sewing machine. I'll be showing you my process for creating this gorgeous, fabulous, radiant thing, along with a few tips about possible pitfalls to look out for. So, let's get started. First, you'll need a pattern. There are many YouTube videos providing tips on designing your own pattern, and even a few that show you how to make a cape without a pattern. I don't recommend. It wastes fabric. Or you could go old school, take the easy route, and just buy an actual pattern. I'm sure Etsy is teeming with them, but I chose the Simplicity Pattern 5794 with Hood B. It's a great, easy to follow pattern. 9.5 out of 10, would recommend. If you go with a traditional pattern, the package will tell you how much fabric you'll need. Spoiler, this takes seven to seven and a half yards, twice. Don't forget the lining. That's up to 15 yards of fabric. This is not a joke cloak. If buying the better part of a bolt at full retail makes your wallet shriek in horror, consider thrifted finds. With a little hunting, you can find amazing used curtains or king-sized bedclothes. This fabric I've had for over 20 years, just waiting to do something special with it. I scored it for pennies on the dollar when a fabric store was going out of business. That said, you probably want to avoid working with a stretch fabric at all costs. Unless self-torture is one of your kinks. Velvet, satin, and tweeds are recommended. But it was too late for me. I had already heard the siren song of this glorious material, and I was unable to heed the dangers. All the warnings were drowned out by the rich color and sumptuous drape of this fabric. Save yourselves. Choose a sane fabric. For the lining, get something of a similar or complementary color, but not identical. Having a lining with a visual flash of some contrast is a good look. Also, lining the cloak with the same fabric makes for serious confusion during assembly. I didn't have a choice, however, because the extreme stretch on this fabric meant anything I paired it with wouldn't fall in the same way and I'd have very weird issues later with slouch. Once you've committed to your fabrics, there are a few notions you'll need. Thread, of course, but you'll need two spools. And on this I have a cautionary tale. Do not get your thread from the Walmart. I hate to drag a brand, but the mainstay's thread broke apart literally every few seconds. I tried every troubleshooting technique I could find to no avail. But I still had most of a dual duty spool I had left from an older project, and when I switched back to the older spool, my thread breaking problems disappeared. Shame on you, Walmart. That's bad even for you. The hood I've chosen calls for a six inch beaded tassel, and you may want to consider a clasp of some kind. A large frog, toggle, or buckle might be awesome, but I went with the option of following the pattern and making ties from the cloak material. As I've mentioned, a full cloak 
takes a lot of fabric, and this makes laying out the pattern pieces tricky. Pro tip, you'll need a flat space larger than a 10-seater dining table or an entire kitchen floor. Ideally, this vast real estate of floor space or industrial drapery table would also be in a room you can shut the cats out of. I did not have that luxury. And they love helping. Trying to lay out stretchy fabric on this scale proved impossible to do even remotely perfectly. My OCD was cranked up to nightmare proportions. I will warn you now, the near apoplexy I got from this stretchy stuff didn't ease off for the entirety of the project. Now, I did study up on how to work with stretchy fabrics before I began, and being armed with that knowledge was extremely helpful. It was the only thing that saved the project and my sanity. <laughs> so if you choose to experiment with the stretchy stuff and you're not already a pro, read up, watch tutorials, heed my warning. Once your pieces are all cut out with transfer marks, stay stitch the neck curvature with a baste stitch. However, I used a simple zigzag to accommodate the stretch in my fabric. Stitch the back sections together, then the stitch each front section to the back. You'll want to do the same for the lining pieces as well, only leave a few inches in the back seam open so that you'll be able to pull the whole cloak right side through when you are finished. I managed to miss this step and seam ripping a stretch stitch out of this delicate fabric was functionally impossible, so I just ended up leaving a gap in the hem later. It worked out fine. As you work, be sure to press the flat seams and trim the ones that will fold in. Of course, trying to iron this supernaturally wrinkle-free fabric was an exercise in futility. As soon as the fabric was cool again, it bounced right back and laughed at me. As I mentioned earlier, I opted for the pattern's included ties. If you do the same, be sure to attach them to the front of the cloak at this point. And word to the wise, getting these things right side out after sewing them is super fiddly. So breathe, summon your best patience, and take your time. I found a chopstick worked to push it through. Fold and stitch the hem of the hood at the shoulder as indicated on the pattern to create fullness in the hood. Then make the underside seam. Do the same with the hood lining. With this simplicity pattern, the hood assembly was pretty straightforward, except at the crucial point of attaching the lining to the hood. Oh, I may have done that very wrong. There is no image in the directions to show how to line these up, and somehow, despite generally being aces at mechanical and spatial relations, I managed to think myself into a pretzel and destroy the hood. Very, very wrong. Now, if you are a sane person using a recommended fabric, and this happens, you could still salvage it with a slow, tedious seam ripping session. But, as I've said, the stretch stitch I was using was not removable without utterly shredding the fabric along with it. I ended up having to cut new hood pieces and start over. Base the hood to the cloak, not the lining. This is more difficult than it sounds. Not only do three layers of fabric all have to line up around a curve, but in places, those hood folds add four more layers to get the needle through without breaking or snapping the thread. I didn't think I'd make it. At one point, the ballpoint needle just wouldn't go through, but fortunately, I had a stouter one I could switch to and 
that made all the difference. Pin the lining and the cape together with the hood and ties inside where they won't get caught by the feed dogs. This is a good time to make sure the hems of the cloak and the lining will all line up. Again, the stretch fabric made this a nightmare. I fiddled with it for a long time before I felt comfortable with where the hem was falling. Additionally, the cape is a unisex pattern and tall enough for a man which I didn't check when I started, so it was way too long for me. Thirdly, the cape pattern had room for much wider shoulders than mine, so the sides of the hem fell down a lot lower than the front and the back. I ended up taking six inches off of the bottom all the way around and only a few inches more off of either side so that if I'm standing with my arms out to make grand magical gestures, the cloak hem will still hang a bit low to the ground. Only time will tell if that was a wise choice, but so far, no issues. When you're confident the cape and lining are pinned together well, sew all the way around. Uh, unless you've goofed like me and need to leave a few inches open to pull the cloak right side out. Once the cloak is righted and you've confirmed again that everything is draping correctly, carefully hand stitch whichever opening you left so the threads won't show. I forgot to film this part because I was so tired, it was so late at night and I was so relieved to be done with this bed. There is no shame in omitting the armholes. Simplicity certainly did. No judgment, no shade. But I wanted armholes. I feel that for serious ritual work, I wanted to be able to use my hands freely without disturbing the fall of the cloak. This could be especially relevant if you're at a sky-clad group ritual and not interested in being an exhibitionist. Or maybe you are. You do you, boo. Since the pattern doesn't include them, I had to find directions for making the arm slits. There are plenty of videos on YouTube showing different ways to do it. I'll link below two videos I found helpful. The first step is to line up where the slits should go. I wanted them at about elbow action. It seemed the most sensible and ergonomic, and I placed them a little outward from where my arms naturally hang so I wouldn't constantly be pulling the cape open. Again, I am a strong, arm slit advocate, but they are enormously fiddlesome. It took me a while to measure and place and pin everything. The pattern I followed called for the slit pieces to be folded and pressed differently, some in half and some by three quarter. I never was able to sort out the point of that. Once all is lined up and pinned, Sew the slit pieces through the cloak and lining, making sure the folded edges face outward. Then cut the slit. Turn the fabric to the inside. Iron if you can. Then trim the excess from the lower layers and slip stitch everything tidy so the thread doesn't show on the front side. I'm so embarrassed to even show you my finished arm slits. My hand stitching clearly needs some work. Again, I'm blaming the freaking stretch fabric. It was just ridiculous to work with. Finally, sew on the tassel. Be sure to get the point of the hood and the lining together as you stitch. And that's it. Not a difficult project as sewing garments goes. Now, there is one consideration with this pattern. I did have difficulty keeping the hood up. It's heavy and slippery, but that's nothing a headband can't fix. Or perhaps using the correct fabric? 
And I've complained the whole way through about how difficult this fabric was to work with, but seriously, for this look, all the struggle and all the tears were so worth it, in my opinion. I am utterly smitten with this thing. Time for the grand and overdramatic reveal. O-M-G. Was I complaining about stretch fabrics? Uh, I take it back. This is sickening. This is glorious. This is the most beautiful and elegant thing I now own. I wouldn't look out of place in Lothlorien. Look at that drape, that movement. Oh my God. Total sewing gasm. Can I just wear this everywhere now? Like just pushing my buggy down the bread aisle at the Kroger? That's okay, right? With that, I'll wish you good luck on your own cloak project. I hope my experience was helpful, and I hope to see you in the next video. Until then, keep your garment making wild. cranked up to nightmare purport. I will warn you now. 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 The near a pop to the camera right. and getting busy. The hills are alive with the sound of witchcraft. <laughs> you don't want to be filmed right now? <laughs>